Hello everyone, it's Drake again, and uh, today I'm going to make a video, just some books that are on my mind, um, whether it's, you know, I'm, I'm reading them currently, whether I got them recently, whether I've had them for a while, but uh, I've just been thinking about them recently, and uh, yeah, I'll just talk about them, see how long I go with it, and then, uh, yeah, Wanted to balance out some of my more planned videos with uh, an unplanned video. So this is the unplanned video. All right, so uh, let's see, what do I start with? I think I'm going to start with some books I found today at the local used bookstore, the local half price books. So just through sheer, sheer chance, really, it ended up being a, a Spanish extravaganza. And uh, the first one here, which has a really cool drawing on it, on the cover, from the Catedra Classics, Lope de Vega, Fuente Ovejuna. You see, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool picture there. So, uh, I have never owned a Lope de Vega work at all, and. Uh, you know, it's kind of surprising even to myself that I haven't because, you know, he's one of the major Spanish writers. But for some reason, his work has just never appealed to me. But I thought uh, Puente Ovejuna, that would be a good starting place because I believe it's his most famous play. So, yeah, anyway. Starts off my, my Spanish stuff. The Poem of the Thid. <laughs> uh, this is a bilingual edition. Uh, major epic poem of Spain. Uh, Penguin Classics. I'd been looking for this for a while, but I wasn't willing to order it online. And I just never found... I had seen this edition before, but it was never in quite as good uh, quality as this one. This one's about as perfect as it gets for an older penguin. So... Uh, not written in at all, like I said, bilingual edition. Oh, that's funny. I just opened to a page. Cuando es farto? Farto. Uh, so, poem of the Cid. And then also, uh, the first volume in the translation of Amadis of Gaul. Books one and two, and then there's books three and four. Interestingly enough, published by the University Press of Kentucky. And uh, yeah, this is a translation from the 70s. I had this at one point, but I think it got ruined in the fire. Uh, and I just never replaced it, but I found it at the local bookstore for 20 bucks for this. It's an ex-library, but, you know, that adds its own charm. You're, you're saving a book from the... The nether regions of a landfill, probably. Uh, so, anyway, those are my Spanish books. I got pretty pleased with those. I have, I've never, I've never owned Lope de Vega or The Song of the Cid, but uh, Modest of Gaul, oddly enough, probably the least famous of the three. I have. So, start off with that. Uh, also. My buddy Cyrus sent me a, a care package. I sent him a care package of some books, so we had a nice little trade. Uh, let's see. Uh, and so a couple of the books, I just picked out some choice ones of the ones he sent me. So this book on Eddas and Sagas by Jonas Christiansen, I was really thrilled with. This has been a book that I've been interested in for a while. I just opened to a really cool page. Look at this. This is the, the original, uh, you'd say, manuscript of Njal's Saga with a translation, a little Penguin's Classics by Magnus Magnusson and Hermann Thalsson, I think so. Penguin Classics there. But uh, yeah, this book is awesome. It's basically a literary history, a handbook of sorts of the Edison Sagas. And uh, seems to be the best one out there also has a section on skaldic poetry, which I'm uh, really thrilled with. I want to learn more about skaldic poetry. 
that one's the one that seems to be hardest to find information on. Um, so anyway, Edison Sagas, thrilled with that. And then also, one of the greatest epic poems of the world that, that's shiny there, the Shaname by Ferdosi. And this one's especially cool because uh, this year I'm teaching senior English along with my IB course load. And uh, currently we are reading Persepolis, the graphic novel. And uh, it's been pretty cool. I chose that one because my school had enough for class sets. And uh, yeah, it's been, been pretty awesome reading Persepolis because of course Iran gets, you know, in certain ways politically, right, rightfully so, a bad rap. Uh, as bad of a rap that, you know, pretty much the United States deserves for, for most reasons. But generally, you know, high school students, you know, cl clunky thinking, and they generally tend to export the negativity of the politics in Iran with the people there. And so this book Persepolis, I think, is shaking up their thinking and allowing them to think more clearly. Um, and also it's a really short read. It's a graphic novel. So I wanted to start the year with something that we could just like enjoy reading. It didn't have to be, you know, a slog for kids who, you know, don't read ever or have a hard time reading this kind of thing, but something we can uh, have good conversations about. And we've been doing that. So uh, one of the, one of the lines from the book is uh, there will be no peace in the Middle East as long as there is oil. That's one of the lines in the first 30 or so pages. So pretty striking given current events. All right. And then I think I will uh, briefly touch on some books I'm currently reading, some new translations. Two books I'm currently reading, both of which I got at my favorite local new bookstore, Alienated Majesty, down by UT's campus. If you're in the Austin area, if you're in Central Texas to any degree, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, it's probably even worth the drive from El Paso, I'll be honest. Uh, stop by Alienated Majesty. If you see Stephen there, ask for Stephen, say hi to Stephen. Um, but anyway, two of the books I recently got from there, uh, Galaxias by Haroldo do Campos, major Brazilian author. Uh, so this one I had been looking out for for years. Where, where did I first hear of it? I must have first heard of it from, uh, I think it must have been Andre, the Untranslated. And uh, I saw maybe a couple years ago that Ugly Duckling was going to put an edition out and the printing was delayed. I think it was supposed to come out in May or April maybe of this year. And the printer had an issue apparently, so it got delayed, but it just finally came out this past month. This is in their Lost Literature series. And uh, I'll just give you an idea of what it reads like. So heavily influenced by Mallarmé, heavily influenced by James Joyce. Uh, John Keane has a quote on the back. It was begun in 1963 and only published in its final form in 1984. Uh, it's described as kaleidoscopic. But let me just read you part of the first page. And interestingly, throughout it's written in this form where only on the right-hand page is their text. Always on the left, it's, it's blank. All right. And here I begin, I spin here, the beguin iris spin and grin to begin, to release and realize life begins, not arrives at the end of a trip, which is... Why I begin to respin, to write 1,000 pages, 1,001 pages, to end, write, begin, write, begin, end, with writing, and so I begin to respin, to retrace, to write, and rewrite the future of writings, the tracing, to overwrite the slaving 1,001 nights in 1,001 pages, or a page in one night, the same nights, the same pages, same me, say resemblance, dissemblance, reassemblance, where the end is begin, where to write about writings, not writing about not writing, and so I begin to unspin the unknown, unbegun, and tracing a book where all's chance and perchance all a book, or perchance not a travel. And that uh, 
brings to attention that this book is uh, a travel log through history and literature and the actual physical world we inhabit. And uh, yeah, just just fascinating, fascinating book. If you are watching this video, I guarantee you, you'll be interested in this. So uh, ransack Ugly Duckling or your local bookstore that's worth anything. Because <laughs> if it's worth anything, they'll have this. Uh, and then another book that I just got today and I had no idea about, it was just published this past April by the uh, Margellos World Republic of Letters published by Yale University Press. And I'm honestly just blown away with it. I'm blown away with it. I haven't had this experience with a new book in a while. Maybe the only books that come to mind are the recent two McCarthy's and When We Cease to Understand the World, I think. Even The Maniac doesn't quite hold up to this. It's called Chronicles of a Village. And... Um, Honestly, I don't usually do this. I'm not even going to pronounce his name. Uh, this is the author right here, and then translated by. I just love the cover. I was just struck by the cover, and I picked it up, and then on the back, this is what I read. An incantatory work that interweaves the legends, tragedies, and histories of a village in Vietnam. And I've been meaning to learn more about Vietnam. At the foot of Mun Mountain, a self-appointed scribe crafts the stories of his neighbors into a surrealist history of their farming community. His crystalline fragments record the vanishing beauty of the village, its sacred forests, astonishing animals, mythical figures, and human lives nurtured by love for soil and sky, as well as its catastrophes, ecological destruction, purges, and asphyxiating modernity in the name of progress. Chronicles of a Village is an elegy for a place and a people, a meditation on how history is created, destroyed and rewritten, and a tribute to the fatal historical disabilities of a land. And that last phrase is in quotes. And there's a blurb on the back by Vicky Now, which I was draw my drew my attention. And the author, as it says here, one of the most important writers in Vietnam is author of numerous novels, epic poems, and short stories. And uh, it was translated, uh, it was first published in 2022 in Singapore, Penguin Singapore. But uh, here, let me see if I can turn to a passage that really struck me. Let me see. I mean, it's, it's, it's all been really striking, so. Yeah, here's, here's a short passage, chapter 11. And it's all written totally in lowercase. And, you know, I have, a, I have an eye for that. Usually, you know, it puts me off. E. Cummings does it right. Almost no one else does. But this is done in a really interesting way. So this is... Uh, let's see. Now I'll read part of chapter 10. You know what? I'll read all of chapter 10. <laughs> Just a page and a half. And afterwards, you, young maiden, didn't come around here anymore. The night herons no longer cried among the dews. Their cry used to be an expression of delight, or a way of approaching the world, or a stream of honest words uttered as they contemplated their own existence, a struggle for survival of the birds that had lasted millions of years now. At nightfall, the birds kept flying to and fro in the village sky, releasing their cries, slow and infinitely sweet. Meanwhile, you and I were walking along the village road, our conversation seeming endless, a journey without a destination, until a night heron cried overhead. It was perhaps a night in March, redolent of the fragrant virginal rice. You said to me that you'd been secretly gazing at me for a while now. I said to you that, yes, I knew there was a girl in the village who had been secretly gazing at me for a while now. The conversations between you and me were like the conversations of night herons, just a few sparse words released, a village romance 
in the backwoods was born like the sudden cries of the night herons among the dews. The sound was abrupt, yet belonged to an eternity. And afterwards, young maiden, you didn't come around here any more. At nightfall, the night herons no longer cried among the dews. My fellow villagers went their separate ways in two distinct directions along the horizon. <clears throat> along the horizon. To tell the truth, no one wanted that to happen. Somebody said it was because a venomous wind blew past and entangled everyone's ways of thinking. It was true that my homeland was then tumbling into the sorrowing pages of history. Night. The miserable night herons in my village were once again flying to and fro in the sky. Not to cry among the dews. That act meant nothing to the birds now. Meanwhile, the humans were misunderstanding each other, bearing vengeance against each other, preying upon each other. Night. The miserable night herons in my village were still flying to and fro in the sky, and they seemed to know that the girl, who had long been gazing at me, was killed in the human bloodbath. Night. In the cries of the night herons, I seem to hear a curious deviation of history. Night herons crying now sounded like night herons weeping. Just unreal. Unreal. Chronicles of a Village. And you know, this idea of history, just just always being there alive at all times, you know, in the present. Uh, in my classes, we, my IB class, we just got done reading The Great Gatsby. You know, we're born back ceaselessly into the past. And I definitely feel like that, probably more than most, I definitely feel like that. And um, along with my reading in Chinese culture and civilization, I've long known that really the weakest point in my knowledge of um, really, really anything, but especially when you think about uh, European contexts, I really don't understand the Middle Ages. I really don't. And I think partially because there's been such a deep misunderstanding of it for, let's say, a solid 500 years where, uh, it, you know, it causes someone who really wants to understand the Middle Ages to really put in a lot of effort. If you don't put in a lot of effort, you'll never understand it. it I don't think it's an intuitive thing to understand. I think, I think really the classical era, you know, if you're just thinking Western context, the classical era, Greeks and Romans, some of the stuff is weird, but you can get a lot of it. Like Stoicism is super popular now. That's pretty easy to grasp. Uh, you know, Virgil's poetry, that's pretty easy to grasp. Archilochus and Sappho and the Iliad, those are pretty easy to grasp. There are some nuances, but overall you can pick them up and read them. And then of course, when you get to, you know, Newton, Hume, uh, Shakespeare, Milton, you know, you can understand that. But there's a gap once you get to the Middle Ages. And it's the gap that I've noticed was obvious for me. And so I've been trying to fill that gap and trying to fix my misunderstandings and just, just, you know, total lacune in the, in the period. And I really feel like I'm starting to get a hold on it. I really feel like I'm starting to get a hold on it. And, uh, you know, as always, when I try to find more out about a historical period, I try to find really interesting people who touch on a lot of that period. And one of those people that I've latched on to is uh, Peter Abelard. And so one of the books I've gotten recently, which is really just a beautiful book, or, you know, physical object, is the critical edition of Peter Abelard's Sick et Non, which is right here, which has uh, on the front cover a section of the Nuremberg Chronicle, the seventh day of creation on here. And it's a folio size, so it's quite quite large. Just just a little bit bigger than my head. <laughs> uh, so Peter Abelard's Sick at Non. And 
I didn't fully appreciate that this was, the text at least, was only in Latin. Uh, there's about a hundred page introduction that is mostly a description of the manuscripts that we have. And then the actual text itself, uh, so sick at non, if you're not familiar, it's Peter Abelard's major work of philosophy, uh, theology, philosophical theology. So Peter Abelard is, uh, you know, well known as a logician and a scholastic philosopher from the Middle Ages. What sick at non is, it's, a, it's, it's 158 questions, theological questions. And uh, what Abelard does is he, you know, scours the church father's writings. And on the yes side of a question, he will have quotations from church fathers, you know, Gregory the Great and Augustine and so on and so on. All the greatest thinkers of, you know, at the time, uh, just Christianity. And then on the no side, he will have sometimes the same thinkers and sometimes other thinkers who answer no to the given question. And he doesn't resolve them. In the beginning, he gives a kind of general idea on uh, the way to find resolutions to these seeming disagreements, the yes side and no side, but he doesn't actually do it. It's up to the reader to resolve the contradictions. And I think that's fascinating. You know, it, it's fascinating that he set it up that way. And uh, so there is a translation that you can buy. It's, it's kind of hard to get, but uh, Priscilla Throop puts it out, a scholar of Latin and Greek. And so feel free to look for that. But yeah, this is just awesome. I got it on sale for Labor Day. So that's, that's what allowed me to afford it. And then uh, along with uh, Sick et Non, which is definitely going to be a life project to read and understand, I also got a book that I'd known about for years and years and years and just had never picked up for one reason or another. And that is the letters of Abelard and Eloise. And this edition is particularly nice. This is the uh, Hackett Books edition translated by... Um, William Levitan, who's at the Grand Valley State University. I'm not really familiar with where that is, but uh, this has more than just the letters between Abelard and Eloise. It also has the, um, the Calamities of Peter Abelard, which is really one of the major autobiographies of the Middle Ages. It has the letters. It has Abelard's Confession of Faith. And then it also has a selection of Abelard's songs and poems. Uh, Abelard wrote hymns that became Gregorian chants, and then uh, he also has just, you know, regular poems. Um, yeah, and it's just, just fascinating. Uh, Abelard, of course, is a famous cultural figure. Um, he's had novels written about him, and, he, you know, he's just in the culture. And then Eloise was you know, maybe the most intelligent woman in Europe in, in her day. So just reading these letters back and forth and the in the introduction, Levitan gives some idea of the the artistry that, that they include in their letters. And it's just, you know, clearly they spent as much time as possible writing these and really crafted them. So uh, really interested in this. Another, another interesting connection with this is that the first translation of this into French was by Jean de Mieux, the, the, uh, really the main writer of the Romance of the Rose. And I've been interested in that book lately. It's another one of these, you know, high Middle Ages masterworks, right, written right before Dante's Divine Comedy. So, Abelard and Eloise added to uh, my current interests. And another one from Abelard's time is uh, this book here, The Literary Works of Alan of Lille. And uh, I was interested in Alan of Lille because he was, he was called a Doctor Universalis, uh, you know, like uh, Thomas Aquinas was and like um, 
Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great was. But his poem, uh, Anti-Claudianus, is really what I was interested in. Does it give a quick description here of it? It was viewed as a classic in his day, is at once a summa of the scholastic achievement of the 12th century schools and an allegory of spiritual pilgrimage that anticipates the divine comedy. And Alan of Leo, like it says there, was you know, a major, major writer of his time, but you just never hear of him today. And the first time I heard of him was from Ernst Robert Curtius, European Literature in the Latin Middle Ages, which has really been my guidebook when uh, delving into the Middle Ages. You know, he did all the work. All we have to do is follow in his footsteps. But uh, it still seems that very few people have actually done that, even though, you know, T.S. Eliot praises this book to no end, and rightfully so. Uh, another figure who's really important in this kind of, uh, this, um, really my own personal renaissance of looking at the Middle Ages, uh, is Helen Waddell, who has this, the wandering scholars, and then she has medieval Latin poetry, she also wrote a novel. Her only novel is about Peter Abelard, which I haven't looked into, but it seems pretty interesting. And then, of course, you know, Ernst Robert Curtius translated The Wasteland into German. But he has a whole section in here on Dante. Abelard is in here. Uh, Alan of Lille. And then another author I'm, I'm going to get into next is um, Bernardus Silvestris, his Cosmographia. I'm very fascinated with that. And then the topos that I'm interested in most here is the world upside down, the mundus inversus, the world upside down. And I've been connecting that with Koyanis Katsi, life out of balance, the world upside down. And I really think we live in a world upside down now in many ways, not to imply that the upside downness is always negative, but, uh, you know, it often ends up being, but yeah, he ends up talking about Balthasar Gracian, Shakespeare, West and East. I mean, this is just a feast scholarship. If you, if you haven't looked into this at all, amazing. Up there with our box mimesis, just amazing. Um, so Alan of Leal, he's, he's a fascinating figure. Check him out. And this is, of course, from the Dumbarton Oaks uh, series, similar to the Loeb Classic, similar to the Murti Indian Classics Library and the Itati Renaissance Library from Harvard. And then a book that was considerably more difficult to come across, although I was eventually able to find the edition, so you don't have to do the, <laughs> the same looking I did, is uh, John Scottus Eriugena, his Paraphysion, or The Division of Nature. So Paraphysion is the Greek title. And this book, unlike Abelard or Alan of Lille, who came from really the height of the scholastic period, you know, 1100 to 1200, so to, uh, around then, it's really the height of the scholastics. You know, Thomas Aquinas comes just after. This figure, Eugena, was a figure in the Carolingian Renaissance. So he was born in Ireland, presumably in the early 800s. His dates aren't really clear. But, you know, 1810, maybe, he was born around. And then he probably lived until about 877, as it says on the back here. And this is published by not the Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library, but actually by the Dumbarton Oaks Institute, as you see on the back here. And then it's printed and distributed by Sheridan Books. Uh, and you have to order it from the Dumbarton Oaks website. You can't find it on Amazon, can't find it on Aid Books, can't find it anywhere. So you have to order it directly from them, and then you get it shipped directly from them. But this is the best edition available. This is the, um, it's a compilation of the multi-volume set that was put out by the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. So volume one was in the 70s, and then in the 80s and 90s, there were other volumes put out. I think three volumes were fully, fully done. And then I think four and five, something happened where they weren't put out in order or in full by the Dublin Institute for Advanced Study. Um, yeah, Dumbarton Oaks, Trustees for Harvard University. Um, and Washington, D.C. is the, uh, the location given 
and then it's printed by Sheridan Books. So this is 700 pages of this is the Paraphysion with, with amazing notes. And multiple things got me interested in this. So many people have called Ariugana the most interesting man of his time in Europe. And uh, I've been interested in the Carolingian Renaissance, Al Kuin and uh, Robinus Maurus and just uh, Theodolf of Orléans, all these amazing figures of this time, which I'll talk about more in a second. But Ariugena is fascinating because he was one of the only people in his time in Western Europe who knew Greek. No one knows how he learned Greek. And it's important that he learned Greek because um, he translated Pseudo-Dionysus, the Europagite, into uh, Latin, and, and so people of his time could read it. And uh, so the Platonism of this Pseudo-Dionysus was heavily influential to his writing of the Paraphysion. He writes about this fourfold division of nature. But what I'm especially interested in, related to my interest in Spinoza, is this, you know, this Neoplatonist type of pantheism. Now it's it's a contentious topic whether or not Ariugana was a you know pantheist as we would describe it today, post Spinoza pantheist, maybe you could phrase it. But one fascinating thing about this book is that it was discovered, rediscovered in the 1600s after being banned in the 1100s, put on the prohibited books list and burned. Um, it was rediscovered and printed in 1681 or 82, right at the exact time that Spinoza's ethics were being put out. So just historical events like that are just so fascinating. And so uh, Air Eugena is kind of my early medieval interest. Of course, you have Boethius, you have Augustine, you have Isidore of Seville, um, which are all before, you know, 700 AD. But then post 700 AD, you get this pretty deep lull for about 100 years. But then you get, you know, this Carolingian Renaissance, this blooming of poetry and theology, and Charlemagne really cultivates that. And then it really doesn't stop in, until you get to the, you know, Petrarch was 16 years old when Dante died. You know, that's how deep this peak of medieval thought is and then the Renaissance. So this idea of some kind of disconnection between the Renaissance and the Middle Ages is meaningless, totally meaningless. I don't know. You could make an interesting argument that we're still in the Middle Ages to a degree. Some people certainly live like they are, but uh, no, that's, that's just a dig. But um, yeah, Eriugana, around the, around 850s is when he was thriving in the court and then um, writing this Paraphysion, which is just fascinating. And it's set up in dialogue form like Boethius' uh, Consolation of Philosophy. And uh, yeah, just just so cool. And I love the cover. I love that cover. I also wanted this because I wanted to learn more about how you know, deep thinkers of the Middle Ages thought about nature. That's, that's been another one of my uh, top interests lately. And uh, of course, this is the book that really got me going on understanding more of the Middle Ages because Dante is the peak of a tradition. And you can't really understand Dante without understanding at least some of what he's referring to. And so, um, yeah, as I'm, I'm still in purgatory. I'm not, I'm not burning through this. This is a slow read, rightfully so. But uh, I'm, you know, as I'm building up this, what's the right word? I suppose uh, ecology of thought in the Middle Ages these deep relationships of, of thinkers and authors and poets and you know, theologians and so on in the Middle Ages. I've not been reading Dante, but I've been further in a way reading Dante by understanding what he was reading and, uh, you know, attaching that to my interest in the troubadours and, you know, Frederick II and all sorts of things. So in a way I'm reading Dante, although I've paused in purgatory. Um, 
And then two last books, and then we'll be done for now. So again, this Poetry of the Carolingian Renaissance by Peter Godman, published by uh, University of Oklahoma Press that I got up in Vancouver. Uh, this book is just amazing. So firstly, it's, bi it's a bilingual edition, but it has poems from Alcuin, what, 10 poems from Alcuin. It has about five poems from Theodulf, who is really just hilarious. Um, Hibernicus Exul, so another... Uh, airborne, airborne uh, person. Einhard, possibly, and then you get uh, Robinus Maris and uh, John Scotus Eugena, who are really the major people in this book. But what really strikes you when reading this is that, you know, furthermore, that there, there was no disconnection between the Classical Age and the Middle Ages. There was no Dark Ages. It's, it would, it's an impossible argument to, to hold. Um, and, you know, this idea of the Dark Ages is really, it's really interesting how it spread, you know, because at no point could it have been proven that it was even reasonable but somehow it's, it's like an accepted thing that the Middle Ages were somehow like this barbaric time. And, you know, I mean, what do people imagine? They imagine maybe like public executions, which of course we still have, or they imagine, um, you know, authoritarian rule by kings. And of course now we just have authoritarian rule by technology or governments. And maybe it's, you know, even more authoritarian now because the, the level of uh, surveillance is so much more extreme. Or like, you know, all of their slavery and serfdom and, you know, you know, people in the U.S., the wealthiest country in the world, can't afford homes or can't afford deaf children, can't afford to go to school. So I don't know. When you look at the overlaps, it's not quite as obvious that the Middle Ages were some barbaric age. But uh, yeah, and it really strikes you that, it strikes, strikes me that in, in many of these writers and their poetry, you read, they're referencing Virgil, they're referencing Homer, and then they're referencing all the early church fathers going up to, uh, yeah, Venantius Fortunatus and Prudentius and, of course, earlier people, Jerome and so on. So yeah, this poetry of the Carolingian Renaissance, I, I wanted it for five years, but you know, you find editions online for $200 or whatever. What did I end up paying? 15, 15, yeah. And Waddle's name is written here. That couldn't be her, but, I guess couldn't be hers, but there must be some, there must have been someone's note about it, so. But anyway, awesome book. Pick it up if you can get your hands on it. And then, last but not least, I've still been, of course, fascinated with uh, classical Chinese literature, as this anthology says. And if you want one anthology, if you are interested in Chinese culture and you want one anthology, the best stuff was all written in, in the deep past, and this is the single best anthology put out by John Minford and uh, Joseph Lau. It's a, it's a collaboration between Columbia University Press and the Chinese University Press Hong Kong. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with a poem by Ron Ji, who lived uh, from the years 210 to 263. 210 to 263. So think a uh, little bit after Marcus Aurelius, okay? And uh, he, has a, he has a series of poems called Poems of My Heart. Sleepless at Midnight. Being sleepless at midnight, I rise to play the lute. The moon is visible through the curtains, and a gentle breeze sways the cord of my robe. A lonely wild goose cries in the wilderness and is echoed by a bird in the woods. As it circles, it gazes at me, alone, imbued with sadness. And then uh, 
We'll do one more. We'll do one more for good measure. In my youth. In my youth, I too was fond of singing and dancing. I went west to the capital and frequented the Lees and the Zhao's. Before the fun came to an end, I realized time had been wasted. On my return journey, I looked back at the Riverside District, where I had squandered a great deal, so that not a coin was left. Coming to the tai, tai Hung Mountain Path, I was afraid of again losing my way. And again, so those were written, let's say, 250 A.D., almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, they were translated by um, Graham Wilson? No. Jerome Chen and Michael Bullock. Okay, yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, so that'll be the video for today. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, I'm planning on putting out a couple other videos, a little more structured. So you're interested in Chinese literature is one of them. And I'll give like my in, my uh, like introductory books, what I would read first. I'm planning on doing a timeline video of the Middle Ages, kind of like I did with my um, Renaissance epics uh, video I did some years ago. Um, yeah, that's about it. So hopefully you enjoyed. Let me know if you've read any of these or are interested in any of these. And uh, yeah, it's still true that death is a gang boss. <laughs>